Welcome to Raising the Curve, a podcast designed to teach you everything that you need to know to be better with your money. Come and learn alongside me, Sophie Hallwright, a total beginner from the finance expert, Victoria Harris. So I've asked all of the questions you wish you could so that finance, investing and growing your wealth actually makes sense. Yes, it's expert education, but that we promise will not be boring. And in the wise words of Cher, my mom said to me, you know, sweetheart, one day you should settle down and marry a rich man. And I said, Mom, I am a rich man. Come and talk and learn and laugh with us because together we really can raise the curve. So today's episode is, I don't know, we, we, I feel like we've maybe coined this term financial burnout. Mm, have I, we? I don't know. Well, I haven't heard anyone else right? yeah. talk about it mm. before. Yeah. I hear burnout used so much to the point where I know it's a really overused word, mm. but the reason that we wanted to talk about this was that financial burnout was something that Vic experienced last year and so not only did we want to get an expert on to speak about what are the signs how can we be aware of them before they happen which we'll get to in a second but we also just wanted to share what was going on personally Mm. in the business at the time because it really took you by surprise which is so interesting for someone who's worked Mm. in finances worked with money for a really long time but I think that's the thing it's like for me it's all consuming in my life. It's my job. It's my, it's what, you know, you deal with money every day, but then I deal with money every day in my job as well. So it's like, can't escape it. You got a double whammy. <laughs> yeah, I got a double whammy. So it was like personal finances, but then business finances on top of that. And it was, it was a lot. Well, you had taken a pretty severe pay cut at the time mm. and you didn't really have time to prepare so when you went full time and because this, it probably started about four months after you were full time, I would say. I think it happened, if I look back and I always, it, it's funny because when I was in it, I didn't notice it. But then on reflection, it's like in a toxic relationship. When you're in it, you can't notice it until you step out. And then you're like, oh my God, that was so bad. Mm. Uh, so on reflection, I honestly think it was when you and me are both working full time in the curve and we'd moved to London. There was a lot of milestones and we needed support, we needed help, we needed employees, we needed people to help us. Yet, as the business stood, we couldn't really afford it. So something needed to change. I don't know, there was, I remember this like moment of like, oh my goodness. And something you said and you were like, when we were talking to investors and stuff and thinking about getting investment on board, you're like, this is your space mm. to run with. And it was like, shit. <laughs> not that you, not that that was not saying it was your fault, but it more of like, I was like, oh God, okay, this is on me. And I felt this pressure of, oh goodness, if this doesn't work, I have to move back home to New Zealand. I have to go back to my old job. I have to admit to the community that we couldn't build a successful business. I have to admit to Soph. I have to tell her that all her hard work, you know, you start spiraling. And I think it was that. Whereas with my own personal finances, you know, I don't have children. I don't have a partner. It was just me that I had to worry about. If, if I don't know, if I got into an emergency it was just me, but this was now, it felt like I had a child to worry about. Or children. <laughs> or general. children or dependents, you know, like there was someone, there was a community and you and, and my, yeah, there was a lot more to consider. So there was a lot of added stress in that regard. That makes so much sense to me because mm. knowing you as a person who is unbelievably dedicated to your friends and family, like mm. m- more so than anyone I know, it makes so much sense that as soon as there's external people mm. or pressures that aren't just you and yourself yeah. and I, that that it magnifies those feelings. I want like to. I can't even imagine people that are running small businesses that have teams of staff, you know, like 20, 30, 40, like hundreds of staff and when things don't financially go right or there's COVID or like, I don't know, there was a few times I was like, come on, it's just you and Soph, you know, but then it's also. But we had know, contractors. You, yeah, you can't they, compare yourself to others. You know, you can't diminish your stress or your concern or your feelings by putting them, trying to put them in perspective of others. Like it's your, your feelings are valid and your stress is valid. It was just how to manage it, which I didn't quite figure out (laughs) so I think there's something in the idea of when your situation changes or circumstances change beyond something you've ever dealt with before Mm. 
that can sometimes, if it goes too far, lead to financial burnout. Let's say you take a pay cut. Let's mm. say you start a business. Like if uh, if you are in a new job, all of those types of things, whether it's you've just taken on your first mortgage and you've never mm. had to deal with that before. I think there's big financial milestones. Yep. When you've when you've never dealt with them before, the stress can become so much that it's not just financial stress; it's actually financial burnout. Yes, and I think that for you particularly, because you had the double whammy of your personal finances taking a hit, and you being like, "Oh wow, I really need to restructure my life." Mm. And then also the finances of the business and feeling as though the financial side was kind of heavily weighted on you, which is really unfair in, in itself. But that was kind of. Would you say that was sort of yeah. what was going on? A hundred percent. And it manifested it in so many ways throughout my life that I almost feel like guilty on reflection. Oh, like. Oh, that. It's also, it's also. No, just like relationship, relationship with like, sorry like relationships with my family, my partner, with you, like the arguments we had, just like not being able to see how all-consuming it was. And now on reflection, just how like meaningless it all is, you know, like it's like, and I think we're going to run through some steps after uh, at the end to kind of like, if you are feeling this way or like things that I dealt with or that helped me. But yeah, one of the big things was just putting it in perspective, like, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, you know? It's like, I also didn't want to have this really successful business if it meant I wasn't healthy and I'd lost all the relationships around me. So it was, yeah. I think that the hard thing for a lot of people is that they may feel as though, you know, because if it's flipped and it's family that relies on you, yeah, then it is kind of, it is a Definitely. different situation. You know, for us, it was ourselves and our personal lives and then our, our business and the, the business financials. But if your business is essentially your family mm. and you're dealing with this ongoing financial stress. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, I think it, it's all, it's all tied together. It's all like, it's, it's all emotionally connected. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and at the time, were, what were some of the things that you noticed? Because it's, it's, I even if I think back, and this is something that everyone can do if, if you're starting to feel really overwhelmed by your finances, is look back to beyond, like before it got bad, mm -hmm. what were some of your triggers? Because even I remember you know, years ago, mm -hmm. there would be small telltale signs, which now make sense to both of us, where you would feel... Particularly oh, with business yeah. finances, you would everything was like you a, would notice when like, the, the bank balance would be getting low because I'd be like snappy and irritable, and, like, <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, we've just got really low cash balance at the moment. And we're waiting for some invoices. You're like, okay, cool, yeah, yeah. But even at the time, but I even don't that, like that shouldn't impact me that much, but it's crazy that it does. But I think that that's really unfair to discount how hard that was and mm. I think it's really important to actually not do the whole oh it's silly mm. because there'll be people listening who are probably feeling up so, yeah. eyeballs in debt True. feeling exhausted with trying to push ahead and they can't doesn't matter how hard they work they've got people relying on them the overwhelm and that stress is enormous mm. and so the reason that we wanted to have this conversation is to share Vic's experience with that to speak to a professional and then to share some of those at the end um, after this conversation with Danielle Colley who is a, a professional researcher when it comes to all things burnout she's just written a book all about it uh, so we're going to speak to her about the signs the things to look for all of that and then at the end Vic's going to share some of the things that she's put in place since then which have really helped move yeah. through that burnout to a place of healthy stress <laughs> yeah Oh, I'm feeling all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's get into the episode. <laughs> Firstly, Danielle, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I'm personally very excited to talk about burnout because I actually have a feeling that this is something that I either have experienced in my life or, or maybe I'm currently still in. But I do think that it's something that's often spoken about as if it's assumed when really a lot of people can just be stressed. And so you've spoken, you know, a lot, you've written a book about it, about burnout. Can we maybe just start with what actually is the definition of burnout? What does it look like? And, and what was your experience of that? So burnout 
happens when you have like really prolonged stress. Everybody gets stressed, right? It's really normal. It's a really normal part of our sort of reactions and a normal part of the way our body handles certain pressures. And a, and a, a, a level of stress can be very, very helpful. You know, like sometimes you're like, bang, I'm on. I am so focused. It's like amazing. I've got this deadline. I'm just pumping it out. When we have too much stress that it's overloading the nervous system and that goes on for a prolonged time, that can lead to burnout. Now, the sort of the three sort of ways that burnout has been sort of considered by Herbert Freudenberg in 1975, I think he came up with this, compassion burnout. When you've cared for something, cared about something so much for so long, that suddenly you, you, you don't have any care, you, got no, you know, you can't care about it so much anymore. And I've seen that sort of specific thing with, you know, with my own children and, and I, I, some friends of mine who have had children who have had really significant problems for a long time and you're on such high alert and you're like, oh, I have to fix this. And there is this like ongoing high alertness and all of a sudden it's like I actually feel like I – have to let go of some of the the, the the pressure, the holding on, the trying to force a solution, trying to fix everything because I'm tapped out. Is it like tunnel vision? Would you say for that first point, would you say like having tunnel vision and having no capacity to have compassion or anything for anything else because you're so focused? So imagine, so it, on that, imagine it's like tunnel vision, but you're not blinking and then all of a sudden you realise your eyes are so tired and scratchy and dry, you just need to close them for a yeah, bit. Yeah, okay. Right? So you have that tunnel vision. It's not like you're no longer in the tunnel. It's just like I am so exhausted by this that I need to put it down a little bit. Like it's it's so heavy, I just need to put it down for a bit and then I, I don't I don't know what what's going to happen next kind of thing. And then you've got this sort of depersonalisation, which is when you start to disengage. So... This is where you start to just think, I can't do anything. It's, I need to pull back. It's this feeling like I cannot be so attached to this any longer and I'm not really making a difference anyway, you know. And that leads into the third one, which is this feeling of hopelessness. It's like, it doesn't matter. I try so hard, I've cared so much, and none of this is even making any difference. And sometimes it could be, you know, if you have like a, a big thing going on at work or if you're in a, uh, like into a, if there's a cause, you know, yeah. that you're really passionate about and you've tried everything, you've tried so much, you've put everything into, say, at work, you've put everything into this project, your ideas may still be getting rejected uh, or you've put everything into this project and it's not going the way that you want it to. You've burnt the candle. You've burnt the midnight candle. You've stayed up. You've put in all the hours. You've put in all of the effort. And then it's just like no one is listening. It's like, you know, screaming into the wind or whatever. So it's this sort of feeling like it just doesn't matter anyway. And all of these things in isolation a little bit are okay. You know, it's when you have you know, one or two or three of them present for a prolonged period that you're sort of reaching this burnout phase. And that can show up in a few different ways. So that can show up in uh, feeling like being sort of overly emotional, being exhausted no matter how much you sleep, right? Uh, you, you wake up tired, you drag yourself through the day, you struggle to find sort of joy, you struggle to find, you know, you start to feel a little bit hopeless. It can show up in withdrawing from the things that you normally enjoy or withdrawing from your relationships. It can be a lack of appetite. It can be self-soothing too much, right? It can be like drinking heaps to take all the edges off. I'm feeling really personally attacked right now. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, oh, I'm like tick, 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 tick. I'm like, oh Same. my gosh. I'm okay. like, holy shit. All right. Look, I've got a great book for you to read. <laughs> the thing is, I think that there is so much around the way our society is 
feeding this this success paradigm that and it's and it's an entrepreneurial thing as well most definitely we try so hard to do things that we just kind of push and push and push and push beyond our edges and I, I feel like this the problem of that is twofold so part of it is this societal pressure for success and what we deem as success and the other part and this is the part that I I'm super curious about, and this is what I work a lot with my one-on-one clients because I see it in leadership, I see it in entrepreneurs over and over again. It's this internal pressure. It's not coming from external. It's not your boss. It's not something else. It's this, this like driving force that is just keeping you, like pushing you beyond and then beyond a little bit further. What's that about? You know, and I, and I guess, you know, if, you're, if, if both of you are going, okay, yeah, I, I'm feeling that, those things right now, like if you're recognising this, what are you doing about it, you know? So it's my whole philosophy is not to tell people don't go for your dreams, don't have these entrepreneurial dreams, don't, don't try to, you know, go for your goals, level up, push yourself, challenge yourself. It's not about that. It's about recognizing, all right, might have gone a little bit hard this week. What can I do now to bring it back, recalibrate my nervous system before I get crispy fried? So notice when you're starting to be like a little bit, you know, when you're roasting cauliflower in the oven? Yeah. When it's like golden, right, on the florets, it's like, Mm, that's perfect but when you pull it out and it's fully cremated on the ends it's like oh possibly left it in a couple of minutes I always cremate my cauliflower (laughs) it's still kind of delicious though right yeah (laughs) I'm like we're walking talking cauliflower florets right now I would say but can I just can I just say one thing before you continue Danielle I think there's also this awareness of um for me that and I, I feel like that probably feels the same. There's this double-edged sword of, okay, everything that I'm hearing you say is pretty bang on. Um, the the joy piece for me has been really confronting, not feeling a whole lot of joy. And I would say um, this, yeah, I, I've definitely gone through phases where Vic's like, are you okay? Like, I'm kind of not sure if you're, like, still here, you know? And I'm like, no, I, I am. I'm just so exhausted. And there is this part of me that feels like, well, isn't that just part of entrepreneurialism? Isn't that just part of success? Is it something that I do kind of need for the curve to be what we both want it to be? And I think at the moment what we're both navigating is, how can we still work as hard and give the curve everything that we want to while also not taking it too far? Uh, and that is like a constant balance because it's so easy to be like, oh, well, it's just this one meeting that's going in at 4 a.m. <laughs> that's oh, exaggeration. Yeah. But, but no, that's a total exaggeration. Mm-hmm. But my point is it's easy to be like, it's just this one time or this yeah. is the exception. But because the exception happens all the time it's not the exception it's the rule so yeah I guess my question is how do we still harness that extreme determination for success whatever that is for us while not harming ourselves or getting to a point of no return because what I understand burnout is it's really hard to turn things around when you're actually in full-blown burnout yeah it can take three to 12 months to recover from burnout and that's provided you don't push yourself into like a nervous breakdown, right? And that's a whole nother kettle of fish. But let's just say, you know, you get to a point where you are absolutely crispy fried. And I've been there. I was like, right. So when I was um, a single mom, I was a journalist. I lost my job. I had a mortgage to pay. I was totally questioning everything. I've been living on adrenaline and cortisol for a number of years. I was partying hard um, at the weekends when my kids were with their dad and something had to give, you know. So it's one thing to have this big vision and know that you're super passionate about creating something, but it's another thing to have like an even longer vision and a bigger sort of view, a bigger lens on it, which is, 
what's the point of creating it if you skid over the finish line and like collapse and die, right? So it's Mm. about having this sort of sustainable vision. So it's about sustainable success, holistic success, right? Whole life success and being able to enjoy the ride. Because again, what's the point? Like if you are hustling so freaking hard that it's actually not enjoyable, but you can see that you're getting somewhere, but life isn't fun, for why like we're not just here to work and achieve and create you know these things we're here to have this whole whole life you are a whole person not just your work and I think for us to detangle ourselves from our identity being so wrapped up in what we do Mm -hmm. I think that that's a really important part And I remember, you know, many, many moons ago, my mum saying to me, you know what, you need, like, you need a hobby. All you do is work. And I'm like, my work is my hobby. Like, I love it so much. And so she's like, yeah, but it's not fun. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. Are you Victoria Harris? (laughs) (laughs) Sarah Twin. Oh, gosh, I knew this was coming. Um, I just want to play devil's advocate, though, Mm. and almost, like, I I wholeheartedly (laughs) I want to defend my burnout. (laughs) No, I, I totally agree what you're saying. So I'm saying I, I wholeheartedly agree. I just, I kind of want to hear the other side of the argument in terms of like, we always talk about when we're investing, it's like delayed gratification. It's like putting money away now to enjoy it in the future. And if I look at that from like an entrepreneurial lens, I see that for my life right now, I don't have children. I, I have the time and capacity. It's only myself to put into work for the enjoyment down the track. Yes, there's obviously a tipping point. I'm, I don't want to get to the place where I, I physically can't work because I've stressed out and I'm burnt out. But I think for me, I'm like, I want to pour my heart and soul into this while I can because I, I can see and see the benefits in the future. Uh, but yes, I totally agree. It shouldn't be at the sacrifice of your health. And that, that is that is completely obviously not not what I'm saying. But I reckon it's one thing to say that, but the other to do it. And mm-hmm. I think we're, it's so easy to say, do you know what I mean? Like if we're being totally honest with ourselves, we have sacrificed our health and our happiness because we've been working so hard. So it's like at what point? But see, I see, I see work makes me happy. Like I love working which again sounds, and I think that. And what else makes you happy, right? If if we're looking at this sort of, if we're looking at the whole, your whole person, the whole Mm. Victoria, right? So we've got the success portion of your life of work is like, is awesome, okay? So what about the other things that make us like wholehearted happy humans things like connection things like time to take care of your health and your well-being and your mental well-being what about um time for things that bring you enjoyment that is not work right so that you have more of yourself and your experiences to bring to your work and you said a moment ago which kind of piqued my piqued my little spidey senses that you know there's the delayed gratification and there is the idea that you can hustle now so that you can have the, the you can relax and enjoy yourself at some time down the track which is unspecified and whatever right it's like saying it's like like constantly hanging for the weekend or constantly hanging for your annual leave or constantly waiting for retirement before you're allowed to enjoy your life right it's the idea of saying i'll be happy when not i'll enjoy the journey yeah it's the it's which is so and i oh, i really want to hear vic's rebuttal by the way vic you're not allowed to say pilates is where you get your enjoy- i mean you can pilates is allowed to be a sense of enjoyment but like not i'm just very strict with my exercise and eating and like I'm very in terms of like healthy eating yes maybe the partying side of things I could chill out on a bit in the weekends <laughs> but like I'm very I feel like I I it ebbs and flows like there's been times at the curve play hard yeah. work hard <laughs> work hard play hard but yeah I um but is but is nutrition and exercise 
We need to pay for it. So, so let's have a look at the chocolate bar philosophy, yeah. right? Let's have a look at let's let, let's go because I, yeah. I want to be able to um, put 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 them into our categories, right? Put things into our pillars. So, the chocolate bar philosophy is looking at the idea of a Mars bar. When I was in total frazzle, someone said to me, "You need your life to be more like a Mars bar. You need to find a balance of work, rest, and play." Is that the chocolate, the caramel, and then oh, you? Is play the caramel? Play is that plays the chocolate. Rest is the caramel and nougat is the work because that's like the boring part. Agree? Yeah. But there's the most nougat. There's heaps of nougat in a Mars bar. Yeah. Just like your life is heaps of work, right? Your life is heaps of work because people are really good often at work and home and, you know, exercise, it's a biological need. Sleep, biological need, right? They don't really come into anything work uh, exercise can be work rest or play right so that's a bit of a that's a bit of a chameleon one but but what I realized when I was working with people in in leadership this one day I was going so far into my analogy so I was like talking about the work and the rest and the play when we put it as like the nougat the caramel and the chocolate they're not equal ratios you just said the nougat is the biggest bit they're not equal ratios but when you have a bite of a Mars bar it's yummy because everything is there so I'm not saying to you that you need your ratios to be exactly the same, right? Everything just needs to be present. Mm. They're never going to be exactly the same in any phase of your life, right? It doesn't matter. And life is phases, you know. There, there are times where we have, you know, more elasticity or spaciousness of time and then there are times where we're really under the pump, right? There's seasons, whatever. But work, because work also is responsibilities, you know, so it, when there's kids, there's more work, right? There's no doubt about that. There's lots of things that sort of come under the work banner. But it's about saying, okay, I know in order for me to do my best work, if I am frazzled, then I'm operating at, you know, 50 60%, maybe 70%, but I'm grinding, right? When I'm rested, I am inspired, I am thinking well, I am joining dots and I'm on fire and I'm creative and I'm engaged rather than dragging myself through, right? And when you are on this, on this, like the the trajectory that you're on, it sounds like there's a lot of excitement and passion for what you're doing, but is it adrenaline fueled? Is it cortisol fueled, right? Is it this away from motivation, which is, this has to freaking work because I don't want to be a failure. Or is it I am so excited and inspired that this just keeps me going? And it, there's no right or wrong. It's like, you know, I can go to the gym every day because I love feeling strong and vital and taking care of my bone health. Or I can go to the gym every day because I hate myself and I think I'm disgusting. I'm still going to the gym every day. Right. Yeah. It's the, but it's the motivation, right? It's yeah. It's the motivation. And I think with which we I think it. that's that's quite poignant. I think earlier this year, for context, I and I raised money for the first time for the curve. We raised a million dollars. It was amazing. We pretty much died. That during, is amazing. During... <laughs> Badass. Yeah. It was very nearly. Nice. nearly it but nearly I think you. on yeah. reflection, yeah. finances stress me out. Like we were literally like running out of money and I was like oh my gosh this whole dream this whole thing we had for the curve is going to be an absolute disaster unless we sort this out so I poured my heart and soul as it did so as well we both did into ensuring we get through this mile this next milestone so that the curve could continue to be a success now I feel like we're still so busy and your days are chocker but it's a different like I feel it's an exciting stress if that makes sense and again I'm kind of like okay cool I think it would stress me out more knowing if I didn't like saying I was going to have a family and not having that financial supportive um blanket because I had I don't know yeah I think there's for me money stresses me out a lot and personally or yeah. in, in the not business. Having it, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think I think that was kind of on reflection probably what spun me into a bad stress, not a good stress. And I can see that now and I'm a lot more conscious of that. That's such a good insight, Vic. It's I and yeah, you, know, and you say that like, it makes so much sense. Yeah, and then I think and even with myself but personally, 
and I see my bank balance getting quite low. I'm like, ah, ah, you know, and it's like, and it's like, no, no, it's fine. Okay, what steps can you put on a plate? And it's like, it's yeah. I think it just it consumes me to a point that I that it's unhealthy. That it's unhealthy. But now I know that I don't even well, want to get back to that place. But for me, I feel like there's two different stresses. Is is what I'm kind of saying. Oh. 100%, you know, I mean, and there's, there's actually probably like 50 yeah. different stresses, right? Um, that, but um, so, you know, if you're, if you're going through a breakup or you're worried about your relationship or you're worried about your child's health or if you're, you know, like, or you're worried about your parents' health, like if it, there, there are definitely different stresses, but, you know, burnout can happen in all of those contexts, right? Um, and I know that feeling, you know, I was a um, solo mum with no money of my own in the bank or I you know when my I was a stay-at-home mum with no money of my own in the bank when my first marriage ended and I was like shit I've got a two-year-old and a four-year-old and no job Mm. I was a tv producer prior to that and I was like well I'm not going to go back doing 16 hour days in the studio or whatever what am I going to do as the primary carer of these two kids and pay a mortgage yeah I, I get that I get that stress and the the adrenaline and the cortisol of survival is real you know it really is real sometimes though Vic when we are in this like survival when that need is gone we don't know how to switch off so we're still in this like still in this like gotta hustle because I never want to be there again and you're never going to be and you uh, might, you might, that's you know? interesting yeah so the things that you did to survive you continue doing they even when you're thriving yeah they worked so it's, yeah. so it's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Because uh, there's still so much fear around being there again. I also want to touch on what so said earlier about like that entrepreneurial like necessity to always think that you have to be busy or like stressed or like hungry. Yeah, hungry. Yeah. And I kind of, it's something yeah. I've tried to grapple with as well because it's like you see, this is a terrible example, but like Elon Musk, for example, like built one of the most incredible businesses in the world. Oh, yeah. And I doubt he was sitting there going, you know, mm-hmm. I need to look after myself. I need to make sure I only work nine to five. Yeah. I need to. And I'm not saying he's the poster child at all. He's had like how many children, how many women. And, sure. you know, he's. Apparently he was a tyrant. Yeah, he's yeah, horrible yeah. boss and all that. I get it. But I'm like, if you want to achieve greatness, yeah. then there's some things you have to sacrifice as well. And so that's the thing I also grapple with. Is there? Who yeah. says though? Who says? Well, I just... I mean, this yeah. is the thing, right? Is that the... Is that, is that, the, is that the, the, you know, the, the sizzle, the sausage sizzle we've been sold? Well, I guess someone else will do it otherwise. That you have to... You know, I, that, that's my... But can yeah. you do this and that? Does it have to be this or yeah. that? Right? So that's, that's what I'm suggesting is, you know, if we look at... If we look at rest, right? I don't mean you need to be taking a two-hour nap every day in the middle of your workday. What I'm suggesting is restorative activity which is 30 seconds to two minutes five minutes ten minutes if you got it but if you don't can you take yourself from this heightened elevated stress state even if it's good stress it's a good day so busy got so much to do got to go got to go got to do 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 right how do you get from that to i'm just going to regulate my nervous system for a moment. I don't know why I said it like regulate. I've never said that ever before. I'll say it. Never say it like that ever again. Regulate your nervous system with like some simple restorative activity to bring yourself back to this neutral space. So if you imagine yourself like a can of Coke, right? And when you get up in the morning, you're all like, you know, calm. And then throughout the day you're just shaking the can shaking the can shaking the can shaking the can so you get to the end of the day you're absolutely exhausted um it's really easy to like just like yeah right so you're like okay well how, do, how am I going to calm my can down I'm going to have I'm going to neck up half a bottle of wine you know maybe I'm going to eat a um a, a box of chocolates or whatever it is because you just and, and binge watch some Netflix because I'm shattered what if you got to the end of the day regulated Because throughout the day, you'd had these little tiny pops, these bites of restorative activity to bring your nervous system down again to neutral. Could could you do that? So it's this and that, right? Your diary hasn't changed. You're still still chockers, like you said before. But you have little pops throughout, 
30 seconds, you know, and the people who say I'm too busy to take 30 seconds to regulate my nervous system are the people who probably need it the most, you know, breathing, box breathing. There's a million different kinds. I've oh. started doing that oh. and I must say it is game, game changing. Oh, hang game on changing. a minute. She's yeah. a convert. Um, Yeah, so I'm not saying that you have to let go of your entrepreneurial dreams and that you can't push while you've got Mm. the capacity. I'm saying add this in to increase your capacity before you push beyond capacity and it all goes to shit. I just want to touch on, so you became a Mm. life coach almost accidentally. How did your journey to becoming a life coach shape particularly your... um, views in in your your path to financial freedom because for a lot of our listeners myself included finances stress me out you know like that that's the one number one cause in new zealand for for mental illness and so you know what 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 steps have you put in place you know particularly from your life coach aspect to ensure that you're on your way to financial freedom um it's actually often cited as the number one cause for burnout as well financial burnout Mm. Mm. Um, so for me, I mean, it's any it's an it's any entrepreneur's story, right? I, also, can I ask quickly: Is financial burnout when you just all of a sudden then don't care about your finances because you've cared too much? You all of a sudden just throw caution to the wind because you're like, I can't be bothered caring about this anymore. Like, is financial burnout quite different to what we've just been speaking about, or similar? I don't think that there's a cut and dry answer to that. I think that it would look different for all sorts of people, but I think it's that. Um, the stress of the financial stress, the ongoing financial stress for a prolonged period leads you to this feeling of hopelessness, nothing is going to change and you feel like this lost and bereft kind of like everything's fucked, it's all fucked and unfucked, you know. That, that's, I think that's, that's the heart of it. Um, Thank you. That's the, the yeah, clinical yeah. diagnosis. Um, <laughs> I'm fucked. Yeah, so, go. you know, my... my I don't know if it was my journey as a life coach that that taught me financial freedom, you know, it's the same story as anyone with their own business. It's been iterations and trial and errors and there's been flush um, quarters where I'm like, oh, my God, I'm rolling in it. And then there's been, you know, the following quarter that's sucked hard and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to die poor. But I think that there has, you know, my, my I, I remarried and my husband and I um, made a conscious decision that we were going to grow our, our wealth and be savvy and educate ourselves and take what we had and make it more and make it stable and sustainable. So that I think that was the thing is like choosing to do something rather than be passive about it, just allow allow our finances to happen. I think that that has that. I mean, it, it's it was the choice to do something differently. And so you know, the first thing we did was pulled our self managed super fund, uh, pulled our super into a self managed super fund, and got savvy about investing that, uh, and then sort of moved into other ways that we wanted to invest or you know so that we had a broader investment strategy that wasn't just relying on one thing or hoping that Mm. you know both of our entrepreneurial businesses work um but I'm really fortunate because my husband is really savvy with investing like um it you know he's got a, a, a business that it's all about teaching people how to invest in shares, becoming um, aware what to look for in stocks, becoming aware of, you know, how to manage your own portfolio, whether you've got $1,000 or $100,000. So, you know, I I, I think it's been an ongoing process because, you know, it was 10 years ago I was on the absolute bones of my ass. And it's been a ten-year thing to having financial freedom. I think. I think even just looking at finances, you know, I, I've worked in. I've been in a number of business masterminds, and when people are asked what their figures are, there's a lot of people, or women in particular, who are like, oh, I don't like looking at the figures. And I was one of those. And you know, like I still am one of those. I, I don't love it. I don't. But um. It's something that when you do it regularly, it becomes less 
scary. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> the money conversations thing is something that we've harped on about and trying to change as well. Because I think there's also this perception that everyone's got their shit sorted. And the more people... No one has their shit sorted. The more sorted. people you talk to, the more you realise, yeah, mm. no one's got their shit sorted. So let's all be up Shit's Creek together or let's all help each other. No, shit, no. Uh, we don't want to be up Shit's yeah. Creek together. No, but you know, I it's like, that let's support each other about turning around the canoe in the river, then... It's so funny hearing you try and do analogies you know. like this. I know exactly what you're trying to say, so I'm just going to take over here. I'm picturing everyone just chaos on the, on the river, and it's like, let's all jump in the same canoe, and let's turn around and go back down the river together, yeah. is kind of, but we're not yeah, going to know. Let's, let's, yeah. let's help each other paddle. Yeah. Let's help each other paddle. Yeah. Is that yeah. kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, okay. That's in my brain, yeah. <laughs> Happy to help. Yeah. I do love a metaphor. Yeah. Hey, um, there's so many other things that I would have loved to chat to you about, but because we're really honouring our boundaries here, it's uh, time to wrap up this conversation. But um, if anyone that would like to find... I feel like that was a really good uh, like therapy mm. session for us. So sorry so listeners, if you're like... Uh, you're if welcome. you're just like... <laughs> Yeah, audience is like, okay, get to the finance yeah. stuff. <laughs> For anyone who wants to find your work, um, you know, purchase your book, where can they find you and, and what are the kind of direct channels to get in touch, whether that's working with you personally? Let's do a little promo. Oh, thank you so much. So you can find me at daniellecolley.com.au. Uh, the book is thechocolatebarlife.com.au. You can purchase, if you're in Australia, you can purchase directly from me or you can buy from Amazon, wherever you are. You can also find me on Instagram at I am Danielle Collie if that's your jam. But um, but you know, does the book come with a free chocolate bar? It does in Australia. It does. It comes with Mars because Shit, I yeah. had a I had a conversation with Mars and they gave me eight hundred bars. So um, uh, yeah, I, I can't guarantee the integrity of it if I send it internationally. So I mean, we could do an experiment by all means. Maybe we should start a book. So called the like the tequila financial freedom theory, and then just get see heaps of tequila. <laughs> I was thinking we could do just the something to the finances and send yeah. you more money. Yeah. I you know go straight to imagine that. that we just get a big donor to give us a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars for everyone that buys a book. Just contact yeah. the Reserve Bank mm. of New Zealand. Or- oh goodness, guys! That's boundaries, it. boundaries. Cut it We've off, got ladies. Go. Cut it off. I We've respect go. your boundaries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm never going to eat a Mars bar. Uh, the same way again now. Well, I'm going to be analysing Make sure that you get your caramel yeah. and your chocolate in, guys. The nougat is important, but the caramel and the chocolate create the perfect mouthful. Don't you think when you hear her talking about all of the signs for burnout, it's very translatable to any kind of stress? So, you know, mm. whether it's relationship burnout, whether it's financial burnout, whether it's there's so many different yeah, things. Work burnout. Yeah, just it, there's so many different, I guess, triggers would probably be a good way to put it, yeah. But I, I think what I found really interesting is the main thing she said is when you care so much, so when you've thought about something for so long, you've put so much, you ex- you get to the point where you're actually a bit exhausted of mm. caring that you kind of are like, okay, I don't care you're anymore. Tapping out almost, I have yeah. to tap out because yeah. I just don't have capacity. You don't see joy in it. You don't, yeah. And that's it, but everything she was saying. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think that the reason it's not talked about enough is because stress in in, in today's society is expected, whether mm. that be in, in work relationships, personal life, but not to the point where it's impacting your mental health, your relationships, your physical health, mm. your all of those things. And so having come through the other side, I mean, I know this is still something you're working through, but you're definitely not in the thick of it anymore. Mm, yeah. What are some of the things that you've implemented since and then now are still trying to work towards that have massively helped ease that load of financial burnout for you? Yeah, there's probably like four things on reflection that helped me. I think firstly, and I kind of touched on this in the intro, is like putting it in perspective. For me, I was spiraling in terms of like, oh gosh, you know, what if, what if the business doesn't succeed? What if we do run out of money? You know, and and you start spiraling and it's kind of reversing that and putting it in perspective and going, okay, if it doesn't work out, we, we did, we had a great run. You were like, 
I don't know. And it's like, you've still got your knowledge. You've still got your skills. You've still got all the stuff that you've learned. Trust yourself that you can find other ways of making income. You can be dynamic and diverse. And, you know, you started this with a side hustle, you know, or pivot. It's, it's almost just trust your brain, trust mm. your skills of like, you'll be okay. You've survived this far. And you will get through this. If we were to think about that in relation to people who aren't in business, so people with families who are feeling overwhelmed with financial stress, Mm. is a translatable thought process, okay, let's look at what you're doing, let's look at your skills, let's look at Mm. how you're making money, you can reverse engineer it, you can mix it up, you can change it. There's you're not stuck in the cycle of what you earn, the amount of your expenditure. It's yeah, it's fluid. Like there's, yeah, there's, and a lot of people might be sitting there being like, oh my gosh, but I, I've tried and I've got to the point now where I, you know, I can't cut back anymore. Or I can't do anything to improve my income. And I think that kind of comes to my second point, which is just ask for help. I was, I was like, and where like, is asking yeah. for help? <laughs> <laughs> and like support. And the biggest thing for me was I got tunnel vision and it was the curve, the curve, the curve, the curve. And I would bail on friends. I would, you know, not call my family back. I was just like, I just, every hour of the day, I just need to be like focusing on business. And that was the complete wrong thing. I think it's leaning into your friends, talking to them, being open to them about what's going on, because you never know, they may have been in a similar situation and have advice for you. But also things like I got therapy, which was great. But again, it, that costs money. So you might not be in the position to do that. Um, if you aren't, journaling is a really good free yeah. way of wading through your thoughts and emotions and what you're feeling. Mm. Uh, things like reaching out to banks, for example, and saying, hey, can I pause my payments on XYZ? Or uh, saying if you have got a contractor or someone that's doing work for you, being like, hey, can we pay you next month you'd be surprised how flexible and helpful people are if you explain your situation it's not a sign of weakness either we had contractors and we were like look can we actually pay you in two installments starting the end of the month and they were like no worries and it was just such a like oh gosh okay we can still grow and do this thing without having to worry about paying for it just now and like getting our cfo like he was amazing you know she's sorry chief financial officer so someone just to help look at the numbers and do I don't it's just helping help and support don't try and do this on your own because I so many other people may have been through it but also people are here to help and it doesn't necessarily cost money I was Um, about to say even our CFO when we first chatted to him he was helping us for free you know and that's not to say you don't have to pay people but I think be more open-minded that not only can help come in very different ways. It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be financial. Even just someone saying, look, I'm happy to look after your kids for an hour a week yeah. or whatever exactly. that looks yeah. like. You just never know unless you ask. And if it was reverse and someone came to came to me or came to us and asked for help and was, you Explain know. Explain the situation. Yeah, it would be like, of course, that's fine. If we were in a financial position to say that, that's fine. Then of course be willing to help. So I think... But I think this whole, I'll figure it out myself, I'm, I'm scared to show vulnerability and weakness in terms of asking for help, which it's so not. It's just going to fuel the problem. Yeah. The third one would be, I really, and this kind of came from therapy, was to think of your life as a bucket and what's filling your bucket and filling your cup, whatever analogy you want to use and making sure that's balanced. And for me, it was so not balanced. (laughs) Like I said, I was canceling plans, meeting up with friends and all that. But also for me, it was about, uh, it was about physical and mental wellbeing as well. So for me, fitness and going for walks and just like clearing my mind is, is so, so, so important. And obviously that was an extra hour that I could work on the business and figure out this financial stress. So I would cancel on Me all so. of that. Yeah. Your darling <laughs> all dog. of that. So, and then that just, it, it, yeah, that's not a good idea. It's either, the so. idea that if you have all of, it's almost of you need like balance. finance and yeah. investing. It's like, mm. if you have all your eggs in one basket, it's quite dangerous because yeah. 
Sometimes, even something as simple and free as a walk for mm. 20 minutes where you think, I'm not going to think about my financial stress in this 20 minutes. And every time you do, you go back to things like, okay, I'm going to feel what it feels like to have my feet on the ground. I'm going to yep. focus on my breath. I'm going to really try and be present and remove yourself so that you can calm your nervous system so that you're not 24 seven thinking money, financial stress. Cause that is yeah. unhealthy for anyone it doesn't matter and then how you can't sleep and then it eats into your uh energy levels and then you eat terribly and then it yeah it's just a whole spiral but the last one and probably the most important and in hindsight i just can't believe i didn't do this is having an emergency fund for the business we did have one we drained it <laughs> and was in the process of building it back up and that's when we kind of went into this i went into this financial stress situation so but it makes now, so much sense. It's a backstop. Yeah. If you, whether it's your personal life or your business mm. or anything, if you have a backstop, what it does to your psyche is oh. unreal. I've yeah. never, even now, I mean, I sprayed my ankle. Sprayed? Sprayed. <laughs> I sprayed my ankle. I sprained my ankle the other day and I, and I this morning had to get an Uber into work and I've had to be getting so many taxis. And there's been a couple of times where I'm like, okay, this is a work experience. But this morning it wasn't. <laughs> and... Uh, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go and spend 10 pounds on it. But that's fine because it's not something I've accounted for. for, but that's yeah. what your emergency fund or your if you fund or whatever you want. Yeah. You can build it up again, but it's important to have that mm. the backstop to know when something goes wrong, which it always does, mm. you're not just waiting for it to happen and thinking, what what am I going to do when it does? Yeah. And I think this came back to our CFO, our chief financial officer, helping us out as well. And we've put limits in place that if we ever got near or close to that level, it's say like, that's that's when we will have a plan rather than, oh gosh, now we don't have any money. <laughs> and I'm not saying, I feel like making the curve sound like it's in a bit of a financial pickle, but it's not. It's It's more, we've now got a backstop, we've got a limit we've got so that we have a buffer an emergency fund so that no one ever feels like this ever again but I think if we were to extrapolate that out into people listening Mm. who maybe don't own businesses Mm. the best thing that you can do before you go and invest too much money is actually to put money aside every week for your emergency fund 100% and honestly I yeah, this has been. I've built this now into my budget where I have an mm. amount that goes into an emergency fund. It's a constant. So, because the thing is, is I'm always going to need to draw from it. So, it's mm. not just I've done my emergency fund, I can wash my hands and, and that's that. Because the thing is, you know, at the moment I'm dipping into it. Yeah. So, I'm also constantly pouring into it. And I think at the moment, our investing club is really for more intermediate investors. And something that we're working on at the moment. So if you're listening to this and you, you kind of don't even really know where to start when it comes to personal finances or how to how to arrange things in a certain way so that you can have enough to invest or have enough to go into your FU or emergency fund, mm. that's something we're working on at the moment. So in the next few months, we will have more content and resources to help but hopefully some of those tips that Vic shared were helpful and if anyone does have any stories of financial burnout that they do want to share we'll put a link in the um, podcast show notes that has our hotline as well as so you can send a voice note if you want to or you can write into us because I do think sharing these stories and particularly for you Mm. Vic as someone who people would look at and just think She's totally got her stuff together. She knows I everything. I definitely but don't. I think that that's really important because yeah. we're all human. We've all we all stuff up every now and then, or life doesn't go to plan sometimes. Um, but you're not a failure if you're going through yeah. financial burnout. And yeah. I think that it's it's just about pulling your resources together, taking a bit of a deep breath, resetting, mm-hmm. and getting yourself into a healthier place so that you're in a better position to make. Yep. decisions that are going to impact you in a more positive way. Beautifully so, said. Um, thank you for sharing. I know that was probably a bit hard to talk about, but um, also thank you to Danielle Colley. Loved all of the things she shared. And if you do want to check out her book, we'll put a link in the podcast show notes. Thank you so much for listening to Raising the Curve. These conversations are designed to teach you everything you need to know to be better with your money, from saving to investing to talking with your friends about your salaries, all of that stuff. And if you like what you heard, we would love if you could please hit subscribe wherever you're listening and leave a comment. Let us know what you thought about the episode. And it only takes one second and it would really make our week, our month, our year. Yeah. Yeah. So please do it. Okay. Mm. Love you. Bye. Bye.